Good morning. Hi, everyone. I'm going to invite my mama here. Oop. Hey, mama. There she is. Just one oh, second. Oh, my gosh. You look so gorgeous. Wait, what? <laughs> What's going on? Just a second. I was ready. I was ready. Wait, what? Here we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. I thought I was organized. Well, hello. But it's only 1031. You are organized. Cheers yeah, to the nervous this morning. Good morning. I know. I thought we would start with like just like a little banter, you know, kind of like sure. how we normally do. Not like we have a planned conversation. Um, okay, can I tell you something? Uh, I, I I tried something this morning that I've never had before for breakfast. Actually, you were part of. You were watching me. <laughs> And I think I probably um, contributed to you not focusing on what you were doing. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I had a latke for breakfast. I never had one before. And your dad said to me, like, a potato pancake. And I'm like, well, yes, but a sweet potato pancake. The, um, and it was, like, amazing. I made, like, this kind of guacamole to put over top of it and to... Um, uh, poached eggs and it was like wow. literally I was a I little a bit banana. oh <laughs> I was a little bit nervous I was a little bit nervous I cut out sugar uh, again for the millionth time yeah. um and I kind of have a headache on this side of my head um but it just isn't good for me so I just wanted to share I'm trying something new and I like actually really enjoyed it I feel like it could be my breakfast here on out yeah, you know, I tend to get stuck in routines. Things. Yeah. What about you? So you get a banana? When you, when you find something that works for you, you stick with it. Totally. Right? So what, a, like, how's your, how's your week been? It's only um, Wednesday, but Wednesday. how's, how's things going? Things are, <laughs> things are, Wendell. <laughs> He's a guard dog, but he's actually got severe anxiety, so he's really, he would let me get attacked before he would do anything. He would just make a lot of noise about it. Yeah, I think that people are into, oh, I shouldn't say that, oh, he's very vicious. I shouldn't say that because of all of our vast <laughs> followers, you never know. <laughs> anyway, oh sorry about God. that distraction. Okay, we, just, we honestly, we should just get to it because it's, yeah. I have been feeling a little stressed because the topic we were talking about today is really important to me. And I think that I just get, I just get anxiety about these things, about talking about these things, Yeah, which I think is probably not, what's the word I'm looking for? Not horrible. It's going to say unnormal. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's not not normal. Not not normal. Wait, what? <laughs> um, anyways, so we're going to talk about that today because why? Because March is endometriosis awareness month and it's something that just still has so much stigma and misinformation and, um, yeah, there's just not enough accessible, proper care and information out there for people to effectively manage this illness and so I think it's really important even though it's uncomfortable and <laughs> gives me the anxieties uh, we're gonna talk Mr. about Wendell, just don't start barking <laughs> I won't I promise I promise I well I'm and, and it's gonna kind of be a different format we may do this again um with other people uh when we actually have a real live like I mean not that we don't have a real podcast but you know what I mean in the t in the original sense but um I'm going to be interviewing you but first yeah. off I wanted to uh, and I did not write this Raina wrote this and I'm going to read what endometri 
endometriosis is. Endometriosis occurs when the lining similar, if I could even read, endometriosis occurs when lining similar to that found within the uterus is present in other parts of the body. Endometriosis lesions are different from the endometrium lining in the uterus. It is a full body inflammatory, oh my gosh, if I could even read, it's a full body inflammatory illness centered around immune dysfunction. It has been found in every organ of the body and is one of the top 20 most painful conditions in the world. And when I was reading that, like you think I just read it for the first time. It is not the first time I read it. I read it many <laughs> times. But endometriosis, I think that might Hard be why they call it endo. No. No, yeah, it is a, just call it endo. It's fine. But I don't, and you know what? In the, in the realm of being proper and honoring, I'm like, I don't know if I have the right to call it endo. Like, I don't know what the, what the protocol is. You know, yeah, it's just like you want to you want to be respectful. Yeah, I get that. But I think in the interest of being on a live a podcast talking, uh, endo might be a bit easier because the osis, the osis always. Well, gets, yeah. I just I, I got I, I'm nervous too. This is an important conversation, and we want to yeah. preface this conversation with the fact that it is one woman's journey. Um, and it's your journey and you are so brave and not in the sense of like, oh, you're so, you know what I mean? But you're, you're brave in the fact that you're, you're going to talk openly about your journey and it's not an easy journey. It's not an easy conversation. Uh, a lot of times people don't want to hear this. People don't want to, don't want to hear about this illness and you're going to talk more about that. Uh, but we just want to want people to understand this is one woman's journey uh, and you're going to share resources. Uh, and again, everyone's different. Everyone's unique. And that's probably one of the most challenging things. Uh, this isn't a cookie cutter condition. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough because, and the reason we want to preface it by saying that is because what is very true is that what works for one person doesn't work for everyone else. It's such an individual illness in how it presents the symptoms, the, the pain levels, um, the issues that, that happen with it. And um, unfortunately, one specific treatment can do something for someone and can completely wreak havoc on someone else or just not work at all. So it's very confusing. <laughs> And um, yeah, so it just, it's important to say that because um, there's a lot of desperation with this illness in just really wanting to find answers and clear answers because there's a lot of confusion and a lot of misinformation. Um, so you want to just do what other people are doing or you're, you're, you want to find something that works and yeah. it's tough, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get into the, uh, the questions, and I can say as um, a mother of a young woman who has gone through this for years, uh, it's, it's been hard to watch, it's, it's hard to understand, um, and yeah, I, I'm learning all the time, and I'm grateful for the fact that you are open to share this. And I hope, like, our hope is that this could just encourage one other woman because it's one in 10. Yeah, and they're thinking now, actually, it's more like one in eight because an important side note to this is there's been a lot of exclusion in this community in terms of... Mm. Um, individuals in the LGBTQA um, community, uh, trans and non-binary folks that um, kind of just don't get, um, you know, don't don't get represented within yeah. uh, the community because it's centered around the language of of just being a disease that women have, and that's not necessarily true. Um, so now that they're taking more into account 
include including those populations uh it's closer to one in eight so wow wow well and i'm i'm glad that the conversation is broadening like i'm i'm glad that it i mean you want to be excluded from this this <laughs> definitely this group uh <laughs> yeah. and i'm not saying that lightly it is just it's well we're going to get into that it's a it's a very difficult painful um, condition to walk with. So what led to your diagnosis and was it difficult to get a diagnosis? Yeah. So this is, this is a tough question because, um, I'll just start by saying like, for me, I started my period when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wasn't actually officially diagnosed with endometriosis until I was 28 years old. And, um, you know, the statistics say that it takes on average, uh, seven to 10 years to get diagnosis. And for me, it was 14. Um, and so it's tough to cover, you know, a span of 14 years, um, navigating this illness on my own. Um, and, so I'm not going to go through, you know, the entire story. Like, I'm just going to try to highlight. Like, so basically, you know, as soon as I got my first period, I was, I remember just being like completely in shock that, you know, everyone talks like, oh yeah, your period, it's not that big a deal. Um, everyone goes through it. You kind of get cramps, maybe a bit moody. Um, you know, it's not that bad. And I remember just being like, what is wrong with me? Like, th this is, this feels bad to me. <laughs> this feels devastating. Um, I remember, you know, the amount of bleeding I had and cramping and additional symptoms, like not being able to actually function at school mm -hmm. or do things that I was supposed to be able to do. And the way I was made to feel um, by teachers or, you know, others, especially women being like, you know, like, dude, suck it up. We all have our periods. Just like get to gym class. You're fine. And oh, yeah, I remember your gym just, teacher. Yeah. Can, oh, just, can, I, can I interject just one thing as like, I remember um, when you when you did get it because it was so much later and yeah. you you were you didn't develop quickly none of that um and i and i could not for the life of me relate because i yeah. didn't have i barely like i was the poster child for it just being super easy yeah. um and i just I, but i remember my sister had challenges with it uh i don't i i mean I don't know what, and I don't know if she had it. I don't think that she was ever diagnosed and I don't think that she thinks she had it. But my, my, and my mother, and my, I know my, um, your father, his sister had it. And yeah. I, jumping ahead, just with all of the things that you went through, and we finally went to the doctor because you're like, mom, this is just like, yeah. I need help. And going, and I had decided in my head that you had endometriosis. And I didn't know what it really was. I was just like, oh, it's a bad period. That's, that's what I thought it was. It's a bad period. Um, let's go to the doctor. He's going to fix you. And well, you can say what happened with that. And I thought it yeah. was the right thing. Yeah. And I like, one thing I will say is just, I was so grateful to have a parent that listened and heard me and took what I was saying seriously and actually took me to the doctor like so thank you for that um yeah, didn't do but it. yeah going to the doctor I remember again it was pretty dismissive and just like oh yeah you know periods some, sometimes they can be painful but it was always you know birth control pill like yeah. That was, that was the only option. That was the only solution, only option. And I mean, I'm 14, 15 years old and I don't know. I, and you, you the, the thing that's important to state here as well, especially for, for young women is yeah. you are taught that doctors know. You listen to your doctor. Even they old tell women. you. Even old yeah. women. Think right. That. And, and they're just in this position 
and and you know a lot of times as they should be as the um as the person you listen the to and they, yeah. and the expert exactly that's what i'm trying to say so uh, you know and you think about it too at 14 15 years old the hormonal changes you're going through anyways and then being put on synthetic hormones in the form of birth control yeah. um and i remember you know being put on birth control and you know i think it it in some ways it helped in that I knew when to expect my period because my periods were very irregular. Like yeah. I would miss months. They were all over the map. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I would I have no one to expect it, but I was very sensitive to the, the pill. It caused major issues with my moods um, and also with, other symptoms that I would develop and, you know, things like breakthrough bleeding, um, acne, um, depression, um, all sorts of, of fun things that went along with that. And yeah. so that went on to going back and forth to doctors to, they would just switch me to a different pill. And, and this went on for years, you know, this was always, uh, the case. And I remember the thing that happened with me um, that I think probably isn't uncommon is I would go a period of time, you know, not having too bad of symptoms or feeling like it was okay or manageable. And so then I would just, you know, I always got the same answer. So I would just kind of disassociate myself from it and just kind of be like, it's fine, whatever. And then it would get so bad again that I'd be like, no, like I need to do something about this. I can't live like this. I got to do something. And I would muster up all the strength that I could manage to advocate for myself only to be told the same things. Yeah. So that it was just kind of like this journey of, of, of going in waves and just always feeling like something was wrong. And I remember, you know, when I was moved out on my own and I started living with Jay, who's my husband now, I was in my early 20s, I think I was 22 at the time. And I remember clear as day, we were living in this apartment and we were actually cat sitting for someone on like the one of the super high floors in our apartment building. And we went up there and, and I remember I was having a meltdown about something and Jay looked at me and he's like, Raina, like, we need to figure out what is going on here because I don't know if I can do this anymore. Like, this is your, like, it was in regards to my moods and yeah. he just felt like he was walking on eggshells. So you can imagine how I felt like I could not function I felt like I was insane I felt crazy I felt like I couldn't control how I felt and um and it was then that I decided to go off the pill yes, entirely yeah. um because I just felt like I'd been on it for so long at 22 I'd been on it since I was 14 and I was just like my body just feels so messed up and then that's when I started going down the route of trying natural paths and doing everything naturally and, you know, doing the, the 180, right? The from one extreme to the other kind of thing. And um, fast forward a little bit more, after Jay and I got married, um, we were thinking about like a few years after we got married, we were, or a couple years after we got married, we were thinking about having kids um as you do and i remember just having this sinking feeling in my stomach because again i had been completely off the pill for a few years and still having horrible periods dealing with all this stuff and in the back of my mind oh sorry no um fine. i knew that i had had miscarriages but I didn't know at the same time. I just knew that something was wrong with my fertility. I just felt it in my gut. And I said to Jay, you know, like before we like officially start trying, I really feel like I need to like get some sort of testing done or like something because I just feel like something's not right. And I know that sounds weird, but I was just like, 
you know? So well, I and literally... Can I, to my, yeah. Sorry, can I interject? And I think that that's really important to note is like your intuition, your gut is telling you something, yet we have this tendency to shove that down and go, no, you know what? I don't know what I'm talking about. I, and I, it took you long enough to actually hear that voice and listen to it. And yeah. I'm so glad that you did. Yeah. And so like, I literally went to my doctor <laughs> and I was like, I, my husband and I want to start like officially trying and I just know something's wrong. Like I need, I, I want an ultrasound <laughs> is what I said. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I was, I was wait, like, what? Yeah, wait, what? And I was like, no, like, I just need to check it out. I need to just for my own peace of mind that everything's okay. And he agreed. And I went and I had an internal ultrasound and I remember just being like, after it was over, like something's wrong. I know something's wrong. And I got the call pretty quickly thereafter. I remember sitting in my car and he told me that it looked like I had what's called a bicornuate oh. uterus. Yeah, which is a whole oh other story, which basically it's dangerous for fertility in that your uterus can be kind of in two chambers. Yeah. And it can cause you to have like preterm labor can cause all sorts of complications, those sorts of things. And so I remember just like heave crying in my car having this massive emotional reaction. And, you know, I remember calling you and you're not under understanding what I was saying because I was so upset. Um, and yeah, having and a follow -up. we ended up going to Vancouver. Yeah. So, so here's the thing. So we, we ended up, I had a follow-up appointment with my doctor. The plan was, you know, we can't confirm that you actually have this bicornuate uterus unless we do this exploratory surgery this laparoscopic surgery where they go in and they take a look because it's an ultrasound and we can't confirm and jay and i said like you know we don't want the risks are too high we don't want to risk putting like any of this stuff and trying to have a baby until we know for sure so i was sent to an OBGYN, uh put on the wait list for the surgery which was going to take 10 months and so in that time, because again, having such supportive, incredibly caring parents um, and just dealing with my anxiety and, and all the stuff to do to do with this, I was really struggling. And so my parents decided to find a specialist in Vancouver. Vancouver Island. Yeah, I think right? we both you helped with that because it was like yeah, yeah, yeah. We went. So, you, so we went did, to, did a trip. Yeah, and it's actually like it. It's a fond memory of mine yeah. because we we actually had a really nice time together on Granville Island. Yes. Um, we stayed except, in that except for little... the except for the part where we went into the the internet room where you can use the computers and decided to google bicornuate uterus and what can happen if you get pregnant and we all know that when you go down that rabbit hole it can be very bad yeah i so like i like end. i like to look um um i like to look at uh uh like when we went to like the Lululemon lab and yeah. uh, that we went to the cake for so supper and, and our cute little hats. And the oh my gosh, shop. that were so hot. I know they were wool, straight up wool. But and yeah, we went to the keg. But we also had... went to your doctor's appointment. Yes. <laughs> which was. That was hard. Yeah. It was hard because again, it's, it's so it can be so traumatic because the doctors are so dismissive and a, a, a very, my experience have been, has been that they're, they feel like they've seen it all. They've heard your story. Yeah. They, yeah. 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 Yada, yada, yada. This is what we're going to do. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's very invasive. It's very, they don't give you a lot of information. 
you it's very confusing it all goes very fast yeah and then you're left kind of feeling like what just happened here and you don't really have any answers yeah so I know. we left feeling like okay we could go back here he could do the surgery but there was just so many unknowns and yeah. I'm kind of grateful that we didn't because I mean the two of us have jumped at things before and it hasn't been yeah. the right decision. And I think that we actually like yeah. listen to you and your like your feeling on it, although you really wanted to know what this yeah. was. But he had already decided without really doing any more work. Yeah. 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 It was interesting. And so yeah, we, we decided not to go that route. We went home and I had to wait 10 months to get the surgery, um, which just could be a whole other podcast. Yeah. Um, but up came the surgery 10 months later. And uh, I remember going in for the surgery, coming out of the surgery and the doctor being like, okay, so you have a slight bicornuate uterus, but it's fine. Don't worry about it. We found endometriosis, but I burned it off. So you're fine. And if you just get pregnant, you're, it, it cures it. It'll be fine. He you're said, good. go home, actually, literally go, said, home. go home and make a baby. Go home and make a baby. That's what I was told. And I was like, what? Okay. Wait, what? And again, like, yeah, <laughs> wait, what? Um, you're literally waking up from surgery. It's like you're out of it as it is. And you're just given all of this information, but they don't, like, there's no It was, one. it was almost like when, just you, you saying it because I was in the room when he was talking and it was really Ooh. like it was just like a casual thing yeah like yeah. okay you've got this yep. you've, you had endometriosis I burned it off like we're not having a conversation about what that is don't worry about it and just go home and make a baby yeah and and, and which I, is exactly what that's you did. so much the, and that's so much information to take in all at once because you have to remember struggling with this my whole life not knowing what I'm going through and then you know, thinking I've had miscarriages, being so worried about my fertility, having to wait 10 months to even know if it was possible for me to have a baby, and then finding out on waking up from surgery, these three pieces of information. And it's just like, and the other part that's important to note there as well is, again, the trauma throughout the medical system that you navigate through is, you know, there's no informed consent with the ablation so what what it was called what he did is called ablation and yes, it, it is burning um the endometrium cells that that are found again he's not a trained specialist so he doesn't have the intricate knowledge required to to successfully do that and it's also known that excision surgery, which is very different in that you're cutting out the tissue, much like with cancer cells, you have to actually cut out the tissue and make sure you get all of it. Otherwise, it just comes back. Um, and so not having any information, not consenting, not and I get it like you're under you're under anesthetic, they go in and they do what they think is best. And I get that. Um, but processing that afterwards is tough because you don't have any say, and then you're also not informed. No, so exactly. you don't know what the right decision is, and that's the care you receive. And then you're just sent on your way. You're not supposed to ask any questions, and you're just supposed to go about your daily life. And then for me, literally two weeks after that surgery, I did get pregnant. I got pregnant right away, and you know thereafter in terms of the the progression of my disease you're pregnant which is not a cure that's a myth um yeah. you're pregnant your symptoms obviously improve because the while endometriosis is not the lining of your uterus it it is affected by hormonal fluctuations in your cycle in that it does you know, try to shed and bleed each month while you would have a period cycle. So the symptoms that you would feel regularly if you weren't pregnant because you're having that monthly cycle, you're not getting right. because you're pregnant. So yeah. that's, that's where it, it became a myth 
that pregnancy cures it because it's this period of time where you're not having that flare up of symptoms each month, right? And it is also important to note that some people with endometriosis, you know, you think because in mine, they said I had stage one endometriosis versus stage four. And people seem to think like, oh, well, mine's only stage one, so it's not a big deal. But the actual um, reality of it is you could have stage four endometriosis and not have any pain or symptoms and not know you have it. Or you could have stage one endometriosis and be in crippling pain and have like debilitating because it's symptoms. so unique. It yeah. just really depends. So anyways, so I, I had my pregnancy. I breastfed for 15 months after. Didn't get my period back until, you know, I think it was around the 20 month after, you know, he, he was born. And, you know, started off again. It's like a slow build up back to where you're at. And I ended up actually getting pregnant again, uh, you know, when Mason was about two and I was working and um, uh, I remember it wasn't something we had planned and we had just kind of started talking about, you know, maybe having another baby. Um, I got pregnant, we were so excited, we were thrilled. And, um, I miscarried at eight weeks while I was at work Yes. and I was working with you. I, I fortunately, again, like I'm super grateful for that. I was working in a place with my family. My dad worked there, my mom worked there and my older sister. Um, and I miscarried at work and it was obviously like, that's horrific. Um, super difficult (laughs) and again thinking like what is going on here like this just doesn't seem right my symptoms thereafter my period started just getting worse and worse and I just started feeling worse and worse um and again you just try to go on with your life and focus on other things right and I got pregnant with Brody um, when Mason was three, three and a half. And I remember just being terrified. Right. Um, and it was a very difficult pregnancy for me, a lot of issues, um, and, uh, difficult birth and delivery. And I, I did hemorrhage after having Brody and I found out thereafter that that can actually happen a lot with women who have endometriosis. Um, and then again, you're in, a mom with two kids under four, and you're just trying to navigate through that. So my care wasn't, I wasn't focused on that until I had to be. Yeah. And so the last couple of years, my my youngest is now five and a half. Um, and things a couple years ago just started getting really bad and I was getting really sick. And so again, you ramp up with advocating for yourself. I was going to doctors. I found a new doctor. I decided I wanted a female doctor. I wanted to go through that. And I went through again, deciding out of desperation to do hormonal therapy. So I tried things like the um, which was horrible for me, but I know it does work for some people. It was awful. And then um, I threw, and this is again, sorry that I'm all over the map. I'm just trying not to go too long and just give you Hey, um, you're hitting all the questions. I don't have to answer you. Yeah, sorry. No, to, it's good. So. Ask you, not answer you. I'm not. Um, the, the one thing that I will say, and I think a lot of women would agree with, is that um, one thing that helped me more than anything else was social media. Finding other women, patients living with this disease, finding groups and finding uh, patient advocates that share uh, credible 
vetted information on the disease and researching and educating myself, empowering myself yes. with knowledge to move forward. Um, you know, I demanded at my doctor that I wanted to see a specific specialist in Calgary who I found out through different groups and patient advocacy that was because in Canada, unfortunately, especially in the prairies here in Alberta, it's very limited, this, the knowledge that the medical system around here has. Yeah. And uh, it's really unfortunate because you're very limited in the care that you can receive um, with the updated information that um, you need to successfully treat yourself. Um, but I remember my doctor being like, no, like you can't just go to Calgary if there is someone, if there's an OBGYN here that does the ablation or, you know, provides the hormone therapy specific to endometriosis, like you have to stay local. And I said, no, you don't. And, you know, it was uncomfortable, but I got my appointment with this doctor. Yeah. Um, and we went together to see him. Again, I like to bring people with me that are that I trust and that are important to me because um, it's so confusing and it's so hard to advocate yeah. for yourself and you feel like you just really need that support. So if you're going into these appointments alone and you're like, well, I'm an adult, I should be able to do this by myself, I feel like you know, maybe give yourself a permission slip and don't feel so bad about needing support when you're in there because it is so confusing. And, and I'll interject as the person that got to go with you, which is like, of course, as your mother and someone that, I mean, we're friends. It's like, I just want you to feel better. I want, I want this to be over. I want you to have your life back. But Anyway, so going in there and listening to this person, and like you had said that, and we are not bashing the medical profession at all. No. So this, is, this is a very complex, yeah. complex um, condition that very little is known about. It is hit and miss. It's like you're an experiment, I think. Each person yeah. that goes in and has surgery or treatment. And so I sat there and listened and I think you can say the same thing. We're like, oh, yes, we're going to buy into what you're saying. And you had even done what you do, yeah. a lot of research and kind yeah. of knew what he was saying. And you even said, um, it was yeah. Lupron, correct? That he, yeah. and you're like, well, I have this, questions this, about this. this. This is a scary thing. And this is something that's super hard for me to talk about because, um, it had such a devastating impact on yes. my life. Um, Over uh, again, as being someone who's super active in the patient advocacy community, I was a part of the groups I read, I engaged, I educated myself, and I made sure that I knew going in. And I had a plan. We had a plan. We talked about it all the way uh, to Calgary. Yep. And... Um, I was like, if he tells me that he wants to put me on Lupron, I'm saying no. I'm not going on it because I've heard so many horror stories. I'm not laughing, but I am. I'm laughing. No, but because of... yeah. So you, you're, you, you say these things to yourself, right? And then we go into the office and the specialist that I saw, he's great. And I truly believe that he believes in what he's saying. And yeah. he, honestly, he has nothing but positive feedback from the community as well who have had treatment and surgery through him and all of these things. So we sit down, he's drawing us diagrams and explaining so well all these different things and telling us why what I believe about Lupron is wrong and the difference about add back therapy with Lupron as opposed to just taking Lupron on its own and, you know, these are the reasons why it's safe and it's, it's going to work for you and why we need to do it. And the hard part about it is, is you're in a doctor's office getting all of this information and you basically have to pick a strategy 
from a pile of strategies that aren't so great, that have things that are, it's like, you basically are exchanging symptoms, undesirable symptoms for other symptoms. And yeah. just trying to buy yourself time yeah. because there's no cure for the disease. And, um, and I think what yeah. happened, like for both of us, we both kind of went, this is the best option because when he was talking about having the excision surgery and how like you may have a temporary like fix for a moment in time, but it just gets it worse. Work. And it was like, yeah. Well, that's yeah. not like exactly what you said. The exchange of um, yeah. you just certain it, it, symptoms it, for for worse, and I yeah. just remember like we both looked at each other, and it was like, I, thank God, I didn't have to give you the shot because that's what we were gonna do. Because we Jesus. we got the, we got the medication, the needle, which was like Huge. ridiculous, and. I just feel like, and I mean, I'm talking from a mother's perspective and someone who loves you just with my whole heart. Um, I just, I'm like, yeah, this sounds like the, yes, we should, yes, do yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. Everything you said before that, no, this guy knows what he's talking about. Let's say, yeah. 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 And I mean, and so, so that's what we ended up doing. I decided to take uh injection of a three month shot of the, Lupron and and also put myself on the list for excision surgery and the reason we decided to do it this way was because there was definitely going to be a uh, wait mm -hmm. uh, you know probably about a year wait and this was before the pandemic right yeah. um, and so I took the shot <laughs> and unfortunately for me it's in your system yeah you took it there's nothing you can do and um i it was devastating i was bedridden for yeah. months i could barely function yeah. um i just horrific symptoms and i remember um i remember researching more about it and just becoming more and more angry finding out again, which I didn't know at the time when I decided to take it, that it is a chemotherapy drug designed for prostate cancer. And that reading all these stories from, from women about, you know, the horrific side effects that, you know, even five, 10 years later, haven't left them and yeah. permanent, you know, issues. And I remember, too, um, one night, my symptoms were so bad. I was struggling so much. And I actually called you. Yeah. I had Jake call you, and you had to come over. Because I was just so afraid. I was just so scared. Yeah. And I felt like a kid. <laughs> and you came over and just laid with me in my bed. And, you know, you're just in that moment, you just feel like so vulnerable and scared and just like, I had no idea what was going on with my body. Um, well, you can't trust anything. Right. Yeah. And just that broken trust. Right. And so basically what happens with Lupron is it sends you into sort of like a chemical menopause. Right. And um, in, in the hopes with, Unfortunately, what I've learned now is misinformation because endometriosis produces its own estrogen. Yes. It, so hormonal suppression and chemical menopause and those sorts of things don't actually do what they want it to do, yeah. which is slow down the growth of endometriosis or, you know, the impact or effect of it. So, um, yeah, all that aside, going forward, like I found out last week, it actually took me a long time to even call the booking nurse to find out like where I was at on the list. And I found out that this week, 
I'm actually supposed to call call today or tomorrow to confirm that mm-hmm. I'm supposed to find out like my actual surgery date, which right. they told me should be end of April, beginning of May for excision surgery and total bilateral hysterectomy with the hope of keeping my ovaries. And that's the information I have now. And that's what I'm processing and coming to terms with because again with the excision surgery the unfortunate thing is they don't know what they're going into until they get in there right and um fortunately now with because of patient advocacy there are things like nancy's nook which is a great resource which i'll link in the notes where um they've created um a site called iCare, which is basically, you can go on and see where there are actual vetted excision surgeons who submit video of their surgery to specific surgeons that are qualified to assess their technique and how they perform surgery to make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing and people can find surgeons unfortunately the majority of those surgeons are in the states australia even the czech republic places like that um and i did actually look on the site yesterday and i was like desperately trying to find my specialist's name his name is on there but it has a caveat saying you know we know he's worked with this doctor but he's very new to the field and we we have had positive reviews from patients, but we don't, like he's not technically vetted. So that's the information I have about my surgeon, but accessibility is tough. Yeah, Choices are limited. And so I have to make my choice with that information going forward. So, we've covered a lot of your questions. Um, but I do want to ask you, like, how can somebody support someone with endometriosis? Like, what is the best way to support someone? Well, I think probably the best way to support someone, because we were talking about this earlier, the difficult thing about endometriosis is a lot of the times people suffering with it end up just silencing themselves and trying to disassociate themselves from their experience because it's so hard and because it's one of those things people can't fix. And it makes people very uncomfortable um, because you can't say, well, do this and you'll be fine. You can't. And so you have to sit in discomfort with that person and be like, oh my God, like this really sucks. I'm so sorry you're going through this. I don't have... Yeah. an answer for you. And I think, so what I would say the key in supporting someone with endometriosis is one, believe them. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. so important to just validate their experience and let them know that you believe them. Because I think that's the hardest part about this disease is going through yeah. your life feeling like, nobody believes what you're saying and it creates a distrust in your own body which is super challenging when you're trying to advocate for your best care for yourself um when you feel like no one believes you so believe them yeah and just offer your support in Mm -hmm. any way you can like how can i support you through this what can I do and sometimes it might just be like just being there Mm -hmm. and sitting in discomfort with them and just being that person that that can hold their hand through it Um, going to their appointments with them to be that person that can help remember all the information ask the questions um be there to help you advocate for yourself. Um, and I would say in that too, is like, I'm, I'm so grateful that I, I get to walk with you. I have learned so much. I, 
and again, I just want it to be better. I'm one of those fixers. But I think the, the best person, we both know this to be true, who's not going to take what anyone says <laughs> verbatim is Jay, your husband. Yeah. Your husband is probably your biggest advocate. And he, yeah. he will dissect everything to, uh, which normal people would be go oh, for crying out loud, Jay. But it's like, no. So if you can, like, I'm, not not counting myself out. I'm there. I'll hold your hand. I'm going to love you through this. But I think having that, having someone like Jay and having someone in your life who's going to ask questions yeah. and like, I need well, to understand this too. Like, and then you yeah. can help. Oh my gosh. That, that, thank you for saying that because that's so huge. Like one of the things that's really in my experience has been super difficult is people you care about or you think care about you don't educate themselves yeah. on your disease. Like they don't actually know what it is that you're going through. And how can you support someone unless you actually take the initiative to understand as much as you can about the disease? I'm not saying you have to go out and spend every waking minute of the day researching like how I do. <laughs> there's, the, and but there's so much, there's so much information asking, there. Yeah. But there's so much information out it, there. Yeah. yeah um, it really is. Now, what is something, um, why is it so important for you to speak out? And I know, I want to say thank you to everyone who's popped on and off here. I know this is a hard discussion, but it's an important one. And yeah. we're both goofy people by nature. Um, but we're also, we have very big hearts. Uh, and why is it so important for you to speak out? Um, I think the reason it's important is, again, I've gone through phases where I have, you know, intentionally silenced myself in an effort to not make things difficult for others or just to not because of my own anxiety of how I'm perceived mm -hmm. as, you know, you don't, you don't want to be that person. There's that stigma, you know, um, I think it's important for me to speak out because I actually have received messages from other women based off what I have shared in the past that has led to them receiving their own diagnosis or yes. advocating for themselves to um, not just be silenced and told to take the pill, going, you know, asking more questions and trusting their gut that they know their bodies, they know their symptoms, and they know that there's something more to it. Um, and, sorry, in that important. is being that support system that actually does listen. Listen without um, a formulated answer. Just listen to learn. And that's where I think, like, the reason we're doing this is you are a woman who has suffered greatly because of this condition. You have done so many different things. I mean, you're going into something, again, I feel like blindly, but you have a lot of information. But yeah. just like you said, they're not going to know what they find until they're in there. And you're yeah. trusting the fact that this person, and I do believe he's going to do the best he can with, with the yeah. information that he has. So I just, I think it's an open conversation. And in your bouts where you are silent and you put on the mask of, I'm good, mm -hmm. the people around you would think, well, how can, how can she have something so debilitating right. one yeah. minute and then be fine the next? And it's like right. you're, you're confusing the issue, but you don't feel like nobody wants to hear, yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody wants to hear this conversation. Nobody, you used no. to refer to yourself as Debbie Downer. Like, I don't want to be her. Yeah. But you know what? You're not her. You're Raina. You're a woman experiencing great pain. Mm -hmm. And you're sharing your story and we just i i am so grateful that you had the courage because i said to you i remember like you said oh, it's endometriosis i can't even say the word endometriosis 
awareness month. And I'm like, we need to talk about this. And you're like, no, no. Yeah. And then you're like, you battled and you're like, but no, I promised myself that I was going to be. And I'm like, Rena, we're not famous. We're regular people and, and famous, pe famous people are regular people too. But what is our bandwidth? And I'm like, I just think it's so important yeah. that if one well, person hears this, yeah. yeah, you know? Well, and I think too, like the other part to that that's coming up for me is where we live in Canada, we're so lucky with yeah you know, our healthcare system and access and that sort of thing. But I think another reason why it's so important for me to be vocal about this and speak up and try to spread awareness is because we're nowhere near where we should be in terms of how we care for women with this disease. Yeah. The access to care, to proper care and proper information is just shocking to me that this is where we're we're still at you know yes. the lack of research the lack of funding the lack of access to proper care and proper information for women is probably the most frustrating part for me as someone who just is natural for me to want to research and learn as much as I can about something the frustration and anger I have felt being like, what, pardon my French, like, what the fuck is the actual correct information yeah. about yeah. my disease? And yeah. constantly having to pivot and be like, wait, this is the correct information? Or no, well, is that like, there is nothing more infuriating when you feel like you have no control over the health of your body to also feel like you have no control over what information you're receiving and whether or not that information is correct. So, and which is horrific. And we're going to have to wrap this up because yeah. we, but you know We've what? We've gone way over. Yeah. But you know what? Yeah. It, it was a worthwhile conversation. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know that you're going to uh, put information and remember it's yeah. one woman's journey with uh, totally. endometriosis. Um, if you have any questions, I know Raina will be more than willing to answer them. You can DM us uh, and, you know, she, you will put it in the notes on the podcast, um, you know, where you can look and what groups you can kind of go to. But I think the bottom line and what I would want people, this is for me personally, and you can say what you would want, but I want people when they leave here, if, you know, you listen to this later is just to listen to your inner voice that that mm. that nudging yeah. that's saying to you this isn't right you need to speak up your 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 feelings are valid use your voice no one else is going to speak for you yeah. no one else knows how you feel i can't say to you reina oh yeah i know how you feel because i don't right only you know how you feel and I can't, I, I, all I can do is be there. And I just hope that people can take from this that, you know, be the advocate for yourself, listen and push when you're not getting what you want. Yeah. You can and be grateful, but demand what you want as Abby Wambach would say. Well, and, and invisible illness is exceptionally mm -hmm. difficult for people um, to, to navigate and to deal with because it's just that it's invisible and people are more likely to believe what they can see totally, uh, and what they can completely understand to be true. Um, and when someone's getting better, it's like, Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's an illness. Yeah. She's getting better. Yeah. Right. That's not so always thank the case. You, thank you so much for, you know, listening if you've made it this far and allowing me to speak and share. And God bless. I love you and thank you so much. Tune into the podcast if you didn't get to listen to the whole thing while you're driving. All right. What's Bye. next week? What's next week? Oh, next week we had ideas. It's about your next birthday. Week. Oh my gosh. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. So we'll have we it's gonna be a little lighter next week. Oh, dang it. You did it again. <laughs> I 
can't. Oh, wait. Oh, it's no fair. You always <laughs> do that to me. <laughs> okay, we only have 10. Oh, my God. What? Okay, bye. Wait. Oh, what? wait.